I want to introduce my dear friend, Rabbi Isaac Heckman, to finish up our morning speeches. And thank you, Isaac, for coming. Thank you for part of being part of our conference. Oh, what a blessing this conference has been. Never expected to feel such unity, such love, such spirit. And another thing I didn't expect is that Margot and I would be inspired to basically create the same message, but just from different perspectives with a little bit different information. So we thought it pertinent to, for, to have me follow up Margot because what I'm going to be discussing is the historical migrations of Israel. The fulfillment of prophecy that God would scatter Israel to the four corners of the earth and multiply them and then regather them back from the last days. But the perspective that I'm going to bring this information out is through, I noticed there's different periods throughout history that there's been different migrations of the lost house of Israel, including Judah. And this started even before the Exodus, even before they became a unified nation back in Israel. So there's going to be new information for you that you've never heard this morning. And it's going to explain a lot about why there was ancient people in certain lands throughout the world that Israel was migrating to. They were going back to their family. And a lot of times they're following the same routes that they knew their family had gone on. And so it's interesting that Margot went through the history from the beginning to, day, to today because I'm going to do the same thing. But we're going to start even before the Exodus. We know the two sticks represent Israel and Judah, but where did they migrate to? And where would they be today is the question. Because a lot of people cannot conceive that they could be from one of the 12 and now 13 tribes through Ephraim and Manasseh, and they only think about Judah having a right to the inheritance in the land. And you're going to find out that every one of you and every one of your descendants is from the house of Israel. Genesis 28, 14 says, And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad. And he mentions the West first, which is interesting. Because if you think about who got the firstborn blessing, it was Ephraim. And Ephraim was stationed on which side of the tabernacle? To the West, where Judah was stationed to the East. Now Judah ended up getting taken to the East by Babylon. Manasseh <laughs> and Ephraim traveled to the West. That's the half-tribe of Manasseh that was on the west side of the Jordan River. We talked yesterday about how the half-tribe of Manasseh that was on the eastern side of the river got captured with Reuben and Gad and went to the east as well. So the father inspires this starting with the west. The descendants are going to be scattered to the west and then to the east. Sure enough, the ten tribes were taken first and scattered to the west. Then the east came and also to the north and to the south. So we have to look for the lost house of Israel in all four directions. And in thee and in thy seed, all of the families of the earth are going to be blessed. That's the intention. Leviticus 26, 33 says, And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you, and your land will be desolate, and your cities waste. And we know that up until the late 1800s, after 70 AD, with the attack on Jerusalem by Titus, Jerusalem was like a wasteland. When Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, visited there in the late 1800s, he said, it is a desolate wasteland. His description that he wrote back to the U.S. was almost identical to what was prophesied to happen to Jerusalem while her children was spread abroad, until the fulfillment started happening where they would start to be regathered which began in uh, the late 1800s, just after he visited there with Theodore Herschel and the Zionist movement. And then, of course, we all know about the Balfour Declaration of 1917 that cleared out the Ottomans from there. In 1947 and 48, the independence of uh, Israel as a state, as a nation, and then the regathering starts coming. And it's not just by Judah. Many people claim the title of Judah, but as they're coming back, anybody who held on to Torah through the years were, were ended up being called a Jew. But I tell you, if you go to Israel and you look at the Jews, they're as diverse as we are in this room. There's red-haired and black-haired and yellow-haired and, you know, so there's a lot of tribers even amongst what's called the Jews today. But we're going to see where all of Israel is still scattered to this day and are still awakening throughout the world. 1 Kings 14, 15 says, For the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. And he shall root up Israel out of this good land which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river. Now that river that this 
prophecy is speaking of is the Euphrates River. So we know that the majority of Israel that we have to look for went north of the Euphrates, and then the northern ten tribes went west and east, and they split off from there, depending on if they're captured in 740 or 721 BC. So we already know where to look, where the majority of Israel is going to be. They're going to be north of the Euphrates and then spread out to the east and to the west. And we know that Dan went as far to the north as he could go, and it's interesting because he was stationed on the north side of the tabernacle in the wilderness, and those tribes with him. And interesting, he went to the furthest point following the Danube, which he named after himself, up to Danmark, to the north of Europe. And so the migration routes even followed the symbolism of where they were stationed around the tabernacle. Isaiah 43, 5. Now that we see that God prophesied to Abraham that he was going to scatter them to the west and to the east and to the north and the south, now look where he prophesied he's going to gather them from. Don't be afraid when you get scattered amongst the nations, Israel. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bring your offspring back from the east first and gather you from the west also. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. So every place that he prophesied that he would scatter us, he's promised to also regather us. This is what the Lord of hosts says. I will save my people. He has not forgot about us. When it says Israel is the apple of his eye, and a lot of people use that text in the context of just the nation of Israel today, but he's talking about us. We are the apple of his eye. He is the lover of our soul. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. He says, I'm going to save my people from the land of the east. And from the land of the west in Zechariah 8, 7 as well. So where might Israel have been scattered over the years? To the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. We're going to look at the different migration routes throughout history. The first migration route that we're going to talk about this morning is the pre-Exodus migration route of two tribes. The tribe of Dan and Judah's son Zerah, who had another son named Darda and how they went across the Mediterranean. This is about 1660 BC that this occurred, and it was before they left Egypt and before they even went back to the land. The second migration that I found, we're gonna look at 10 this morning, so that gives me about five minutes for each migration route, when I could spend all day on each one of these points. So if you do your own research, this is just giving you the tip of the iceberg so that you go home and you research this on your own. Solomon's exploits, when he, as Margot was saying, had shipping routes with the Phoenicians all over the world, Israel went on these ships, and they were scattered around the world through these trade routes. We will look at that. The two and a half tribes deported by Assyria, and how they went north and east through China, and then dropped down into India. The other tribes on the west side of the Jordan River that Assyria came back and took into exile in 722 BC, and they're still been scattered to our day today. Then we're going to look at the southern kingdom's exile by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC and how he took him to Babylon. But then Cyrus was set up as God's anointed and took him further east to Persia. And do you know when they came back from um, Persia with Ezra, there was only about 50,000 that came back. A huge number of the house of Judah and Benjamin stayed in Persia and in Babylon and continued to migrate east. So we have to look at that. In the first century... We know Yeshua was sent, but for the lost house of Israel. And he sent emissaries out. And we will look at where some of these different disciples went to around the world. And so they're further, they're following the routes of the lost house of Israel where they've gone before. So this gives us an idea of where they might be. We will look at the Jewish diaspora since the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And then we'll look at the exile from Spain and the migration route to the Americas uh, during the Alhamburg Decree of 1492. This is the time of Columbus, and many people don't realize that Columbus was most likely Jewish. He wrote his letters slightly different to his own family than he did to Queen Isabella and Ferdinand in those days. Then we have the migrations, which we didn't know too much about until Margot enlightened us yesterday about the migration of the Jews to China and then also to um, the Philippines through Magellan and Spain's influence on exploration uh, in about 1500s is when Magellan was sailing the seas. And then the tenth and final one that we'll look at this morning is the expansion of the British Ephraim Empire that further scattered wherever there wasn't an Israelite before that. 
they finish the job and totally scattered. It's like a sower in the seed, just scattering that seed throughout the world as they um, put people into place to rule in these different countries that their empire controlled. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the pre-Exodus migration. And the Greek historian Diodorus Siculus in 8, uh, 80 to 20 BC indicates that there was more than one exodus of the Hebrews from Egypt. Now most of the great information that's been preserved today, so much information has been lost for different reasons, but the Greeks are a great resource for history and early history. And the writers of antiquity have preserved the knowledge of their destinations and their subsequent lives. The trails of these Hebrews are closely followed in Greek literature. They've even created mythology about these early settlers of Athens, Greece, and of Troy there in Turkey. And they laid the foundation for many of the greatest Grecian tales, even the leading clues in the names that settled their countries, such as Macedonia. See, Dan is hidden in the name Macedonia because he was the first one to settle Macedonia. Alexander, which we call in the West, Alexander the Great, but the Jews don't call him so great because they didn't like the Greek oppression. They call him As Alexander the Macedonian. And you know, during the um, Olympics of uh, his time, when he was a young boy, he went to enter the Olympics, and they had a rule that only uh, the Greeks could uh, participate in the Olympic Games. And he had to prove his lineage. And he proved his lineage through Dan. And that's how they allowed him to come in the games, and he won many games. He says, I am a Macedonian, and I am from the tribe of Dan. So it's really interesting as we look back at that early Greek history. And if you look at Masse in the Greek, Masse means distant, or long, far off. So this is the term that Dan would have named himself after first coming across the Mediterranean from the land of Goshen. And he would have said, we're distant Dans. Most of our other family is still back in Egypt, because it's not the whole tribe that moves. A lot of times it's only the wealthy that get out of a place before the times get bad. And they were the wealthy ship owners, and they had learned a lot from the Phoenicians as well. So they were called the distant Danites. Danius was a leader in the tribe of Dan, and the Hebrew Danites were known as sailors and sailing merchants. While the wealthy ship owners in the tribe made their escape from Egypt, Many Danites were left behind and later departed the exodus led by Moshe. Danius, the Israelite, made voyage from Egypt to the Isle of Rhodes first, and then to Argos, Greece. Now, if you look at a map, which I'll show you later, Rhodes is just slightly on the route from Egypt. Once you cross, it'll be the first thing you hit to south of Turkey, and then you get to Greece. Later, the Danans sailed on westward, following Judah's son, Zerah's line. Zerah, we'll talk about his two sons that migrated to the west. And they settled the area of Sardinia, which is a name that Dan actually gave it. Because you, anytime you have Dan, or Don, or Din, D-I-N, D-A-N, D-O-N, these are clues that, of places where Dan has left his name. So Sardinia is actually a name that Dan would have given that area that Zara settled earlier. And then on to Spain, which they named Iberia after Eber, which was Abraham's grandfather. This is the term that we, makes us all Iberites in Hebrew, but Hebrews is the term that Hebrew comes from. So Spain was called Iberia. It's interesting, many places around the world where Israel migrated, they named Iberia, it's not just Spain. Do you know Ireland at one time was named Iberia? And through the Caucasus, where the Black Sea is up to the west and the uh, sea, Caspian Sea is to the east, they named that area Iberia as well. So these are all places where Hebrews migrated in different directions. So here's a great map, and I have to thank Mary Ellen in the back for turning me on to this great map, which kind of inspired this study because it shows this line. This is a place called Saïs, S-A-I-S, in Egypt which was the primary shipping port for Goshen, coming in and out of Goshen. And the Danites had ships trading all the time through here. So the first place they would have gone to is Rhodes. This is Turkey here, and this is Macedonia, Greece. And then they would have come over to Argos, Greece. And then later, um, we have Zara's two sons, which would have sailed this direction over to Sardinia, 
and then settling Iberia, which is Spain, and then up to Ireland. And Zara's two sons were named Calcos and Darda, and we will talk about them. So Dan settles this area first until Judah's line goes and settles the rest of the area, and then they follow. So think of Dan and Judah as always kind of traveling together. Even after Dan, you can't really see it here, but if you imagine him coming over the Black Sea, and this is the Danube River, and it goes to the north, it looks like a snake. And this is what his father Jacob was seeing in vision, his migration route. Some of the tribe of Dan that went through the Exodus that didn't depart earlier would have come up through here and migrated like a snake all the way up to Denmark and then dropped down to Northern Ireland and Scotland where Judah had already settled through his son Zerah. So once again, they're reuniting. Dan and Judah are reuniting all the way over in Ireland and Scotland, as well as down here in the Isles. Fascinating information. So we'll talk about Judah's son Zerah's lineage as they migrated also before the Exodus. And they crossed the Mediterranean to Crete and then to Troy. That was their migration route. Zara became the father of Darda. And we have this lineage recorded for us even in the Bible in 1 Corinthians I mean, 1 Chronicles 2, 6, for which the Dardanians were named. Darda is said to have founded Dardania on Mount Ida, which is in Turkey, southeast of the Dardanelles. And that's what that whole area, when you think of John writing to the seven churches, so to speak, these are seven assemblies of ancient Hebrews who are coming to a knowledge of Yeshua in Turkey. That's the Dardanelles. That's what that area was called before uh, it was called Turkey. So here you have those routes again. It's interesting that in Ireland, there was a group called the Tuatha de Danann of Ireland, and they were beyond doubt the tribe of Dan, while the north part of Ireland and the Milesian Scots were no doubt the royal part of Judah. So there you go, Joe. You are a part of Judah, and you didn't even realize it, through his son, Zerah. Now, Zerah came out first. Remember his hand came out? Judah actually married, or had relations, I should say, with Tamar. Do you remember that story? Do you know who Tamar was? She was the granddaughter of Melchizedek. And this is the lineage that Yeshua comes through. So when it says he's of the order of Melchizedek, it's not just spiritual, it's literal as well. And we see her having twins, or two boys. And the first one reaches his hand out, and they tie a scarlet thread out so they know which one's the firstborn coming out. But he reaches his hand back in, and then Perez comes out. And so Zara is kind of lost the first, the firstborn, or the, the right of the firstborn blessing, right? So he has no inheritance he's thinking to hold on to, and he has no problem leaving early before the exodus. And they go all the way up to Scotland and Ireland. And this red hand of Zara gets translated through heraldry all the way down through the ages to our day today. Northern Ireland, you can see their flag here, has the red cross because they end up becoming believers. So they've got the cross, but they are always going to remember that Zara, the second son of Judah, with, you have the star of David, still has the scepter. The scepter shall not depart from <coughs> Judah. So they're claiming their royal right. So this is Northern Ireland. Scotland records it in a different way. We know the line of Judah is part of heraldry, but there's a gold line for Perez's family, which King David and Yeshua came through. But Zara's line that left the Exodus, or before the Exodus and went to Scotland, they record it with what you, uh, Stephen shared yesterday about the rampant line. This is a good example of the rampant line. It's, he's up on his hind two feet, and he's red because he's indicating that he's from Zara. Genesis 46, 12 says, the sons of Judah, Er and Onan and Shelah and Perez and Zerah, so there's their names, were coming down to Egypt. But Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul, and this is where David and Yeshua come through. The sons of Zerah were Zimri, Ethan, Haman, Calcol, and Darda, five of them in all. I'm only going to share about the migration routes of two of them, Calcol and Darda. The Dardanelles is a narrow natural strait, an intentionally significant waterway in northwestern Turkey that leads to Istanbul. So it's the waterway from the Mediterranean that leads to Istanbul, and it's the place where the Pillars of Hercules used to stand. It was an amazing entrance. It just came right down to a narrow place where there was big 
um, walls on both sides. And so this was a pivotal place to control. And you know that Constantine ended up moving the Roman Empire to this place as well. So here's the Dardanelles, where the seven churches are. And here's that little strait they controlled. Troy would be right here, which they founded, the Sons of Zerah. And this is where the Pillars of Hercules would be. And Istanbul is here now today. In the early migration of Darda, it's noted in the book how Israel came to Britain. They say, and I quote, actually, groups of Israelites began to migrate away from the main body before the Israelite nation was formed, while as a people they were still in bondage in Egypt. One of these groups, under the leadership of Calcol, a prince of the tribe of Judah, went westward across the Mediterranean, eventually settling in Ulster, Ireland. Another, under the leadership of Dardanus, a brother of Calcol, which we just read in Chronicles, crossed to Asia Minor to found the kingdom later known as Troy. Dardanus is said to have built Troy about 34 years before the Exodus, according to the British history traced from Egypt and Palestine by L.G.A. Roberts. Historical record tells of the western migration of the descendants of Calcol along the shores of the Mediterranean Sea, establishing Iberia trading settlements from Greece to Sardinia to Spain going westward. One settlement, now called Zaragoza, and you hear the term Zara in it? He's giving his father a memory by naming the place. In the Ebro Valley in Spain, which is still there to this day, the Ebro River, the main river where they would dock their ships and go inland, Ebro for an Ebrit, named after the Hebrews as well, named this place Zaragoza, meaning the stronghold of Zara, of the line of Judah. From Spain, they continued westward as far as Ireland. The Iberians gave their name to Ireland, calling the island Iberni, which was later abbreviated to Erni, and subsequently Latinized to Hibernia, a name that still adheres to Ireland today. So here's Spain, and they would have sailed across from uh, Sardinia, and then the Ebro River starts right here, and it goes up and about as far as you know, where there was a good port for them to stop in this river before it gets too small, because it actually starts all the way here and it empties out into the Baltic. Um, Zaragoza is where they would have named this town for their father. So this kind of just gives you an overview. From Egypt before the Exodus, they're scattering this way and this way and this way. And these are the routes that we will see later Jeremiah follows. When he's trying to reunite the kingdom of Judah, both lines, Zara and Perez, this is the route that he follows during the, the siege on Jerusalem. He hides the daughters of Zedekiah under the temple until Nebuchadnezzar takes the exiles like Daniel and Ezekiel and all of those to Babylon. And then he goes down to Egypt, and one of the daughters gets married down there and to royalty. The other daughter, named Titefi, which we will talk about, he ends up taking across the same route that Zara had early talk, uh, taken, stopping in Sardinia and stopping in Spain, and in Spain, he met the tribe of Gad, who controlled the Strait of Gibraltar at that time. And they are the ones that put him in touch with the royalty of Judah up in Ireland. He couldn't just go and proclaim himself to Judah. He had to kind of get an invitation to go. So they stopped here and then went on to Ireland. And the daughter of Zedekiah from Zerah's line ends up getting married to one of the royal kings of Perez's line. And I mean, Titebi was from Perez's line, and she ends up getting married to a king from Zerah's line up there, uniting the, the both brothers of Judah once again. I can imagine that Jeremiah must have thought he was helping facilitate the coming of Mashiach through the line of Judah by doing this. The descendants of Darda ruled ancient Troy for some hundreds of years until the city was destroyed in the famous siege of Troy. Aeneas, the last of the royal blood of the Tsar of Judah line, collected the remnants of his nation and traveled with them to Italy. There he married the daughter of Latinus, king of the Latins, and subsequently founded the Roman Empire. We also know from ancient scriptures found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that Italy at that time was ruled by one of the descendants of Esau, a grandson actually named Zepho. And so maybe Latinus comes from Zepho's line. And so you even see Ephraim and Judah through this marriage kind of being reunited. Aeneas's son, Brutus, 
with a large party of the Trojans, migrated to Malta, and there was advised to reestablish his people in the Great White Islands, they used to be called, an early name for the British Isles, as anyone who's sailed in can see the cliffs, the white cliffs, due to its chalky cliffs. This advice is recorded in an archaic Greek form on the Temple of Diana in Kyr Troy, which means New Troy. A historic stone still stands in the town of Totinus on the shore at Torbay, commemorating his coming, and this is about 1100 BC. Brutus then made contact with his kindred blood in Britain and built for himself a new capital city to which he gave the name Seor Treor, or New Tro Troy. The Romans later called it Londinium, also known later as London. And this is where Paul went and preached because he knew the lost Hebrews were there. And at the eastern gate of Londinium, there was something called the Mud Gate. And Acts 29 uh, describes Paul's journey, which the Romans have taken out of the canonized Bible because they wanted to make it as if Paul stayed in Rome and founded the Roman Catholic Church, which he did not. He stopped in Rome, ministered to the Hebrews there, went on to Spain, ministered to them there. They all recognized him. Then he went up to Ireland, and or first to Lud, and preached at Ludgate, which there's the Cathedral of St. Paul to this day, commemorating the place where he preached from. And then the Druids from Ireland, from the lost tribes of Zara, came to him. They heard that this emissary from Jerusalem had come. And the Druids present themselves and show all of these traditions that they've been preserving from the time that they got there, from the time of uh, leaving Egypt. And Paul recognizes all of these things as Jewish traditions. And he says, by their rites and ceremonies, it's written, I recognize them to be... Yehudim, they're of the tribe of Judah. Even Paul recognized this. And then he went inward, but we'll talk about that later. So for brevity's sake, we'll jump forward 500 years to Solomon's exploits. Now the rest of Israel has migrated up from Egypt, and the Davidic kingdom is united, 13 tribes living in Israel. And we know that David expanded his kingdom and Solomon even more, and there was riches beyond number that couldn't even be counted that were coming in as tribute from the whole world that they ruled. And we will just talk about some of the Phoenician sailing routes, but I also want to bring up the Native American connection for our brother and sister here that came about at this time, 1000 BC, when many of the Hebrews came to the New World to collect copper ore from the Great Lakes area. And then Solomon had a lot of offspring in Africa. And we will talk about how he probably had more African wives than he did wives from Japheth or Semitic wives. And we'll look at some scripture for that. Psalms 106, 47 says, the fact that some of Israel was already dispersed at the time of David is evident when he writes, Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations. So King David is writing this at 1000 BC. Gather us from the nations. He already knew, even in 1000 BC, they were already scattered. That we may give thanks to your holy name and glory and your praise. Solomon, the son of King David and Bathsheba, who was a foreigner, she was of actually a Canaanite line, became king of Judah. Now, if you think of Ham, and Ham's name in Hebrew means hot, and that's why Noah gave him the inheritance to the south, where Shem was to take the Middle East, and Japheth was to take all of Europe. And so Ham had four sons. He had Canaan, and he had Cush, he had Mitzrayim, and Put. And Bathsheba was from that line. So most likely, she was beautifully colored. And they had lots of children. Well, you know, Solomon actually came from uh, this line. So it's no wonder that Solomon might be attracted to all of the beautiful ladies in Africa and had uh, many, well, we know, 300 wives and 700 concubines and children from each one to create this amazing world peace deal. <laughs> he became king of Judah and Israel in the year 967 B.C. It's ironic that this is what Europe tried to recreate, didn't they? Through intermarriage, a unified kingdom. And uh, he reigned from the age of 20 until his death in 928 BCE. While Solomon's wisdom is generally perceived as being focused on his parables and his poetry, or his insights into human nature, 
His political and economic acumen is often overlooked. The rapid expansion of Israel's commerce during this time and trade and industry around the world leading to Israel's further expansion and dispersion during his reign is often overlooked. The Phoenicians, which he had a trade agreement with, were experienced in the business of set, uh, settling up copper furnaces and refineries. Their smelting mines in Sardinia and Spain, which is why these were such pivotal trade stop routes for sailors, and as Margot mentioned this morning, where Tarsus was located on the other side of the Strait of Gibraltar, after the ships specifically equipped for transporting ore and metal cargo would come and get their ore refined. It's recorded in 1 Kings 10.22 that the Phoenicians also built a Tarshish sheep for Solomon. So he had his own ships, and he would have the tribes working on them. We know Zebulon was a sailor, Dan was a sailor, so there was many people that were familiar with sailing. So here's some of those trade routes. <clears throat> you can see Solomon would be here in Israel, in Jerusalem. But he's got trade routes going down through the Red Sea and going out to India. And there was um, Sabbath keepers on the western shores of India until the Roman Catholic Church persecuted them and made them start worshiping on Sunday. But to this day, when I went to Goa, which is right here on the west coast of India, there's still a whole group called the Disciples of St. Thomas, because this is where Thomas, which we'll look at later, went to minister to the Lost House of Israel. There's migration routes through the Silk Road to China and then down into India, different parts of India, and off uh, through the Mediterranean and up to uh, Ireland and the British Isles, all the way down the African coast on both sides, and then what a lot of people don't know is even to America. But they kept that secret. They wanted, it was rich in ore and resources, so they created stories of the ends of the earth. Don't fall off the end of the earth if you sail out too far. Or there's sea monsters out there. Don't go out there. It's kind of like, let's keep this new world to ourselves. It's very rich in resources. It's long been known that the Phoenician ships traded throughout the Mediterranean and the western shores of Europe and Africa and the British Isles. And it has recently been discovered that the Phoenician trade routes extended all the way uh, past Asia and India, but westward to the New World as well. When King David began to prepare for Solomon to build the great temple in Jerusalem, besides the gold and silver that he gathered from his conquest in other nations, he also gathered bronze, which comes from the copper ore, and iron beyond measure. It says they couldn't even measure that. They weighed the gold and the silver and all these other metals, but the copper ore, and I'll show you how much came from the Great Lakes area, was more than they could even number. Second Chronicles 22. King Solomon's fleet would return to Israel after three years. This is how long it would take to go and get that ore and come back from the New World. And it makes sense, because in one of the lost books of Ezra that's been restored from the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's actually called Fourth Ezra, he talks about this prophecy, about this place where God would protect his people in the last days. And he says it's about a year and a half's journey to this place, but he didn't identify what it was. So if you take a year and a half to America and a year and a half back, it makes perfect sense. Now you have Ezra and Solomon confirming one another. Once every three years, the merchant ships came bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and monkeys from around the world. So Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom, 1 Kings 10.22. A voyage of three years could only mean that it was a fleet devoted to not just world exploration around the Middle East, but coming to the New World. Historical evidence exists to prove that copper trading occurred between North America and the Old World prior to, during, and after the reign of King David. Around the northern shore of Lake Superior and on the adjacent Il Royale, it's called, there are approximately 5,000 ancient copper mines working. Charcoal has been found at the bases of these ancient mining pits, yielding carbon dating, indicating that the mines were operating around 1000 BC. So it's beautiful confirmations. The most conservative estimates by mining engineers show that at least 500 million pounds of metallic copper were removed. So you can imagine, this is why it was said without number. Now, to address the Native American connection. A member of the Hebrew and Middle Eastern Studies of Harvard University said that a number of Hebrew inscriptions have been found in American graves that originally they incorrectly identified as Indian. I think it's fascinating that the tribe of Gad, who controlled the Strait of Gibraltar, which was the last stop before coming to the New World, where all the people would have gathered on these ships, 
their symbol of heraldry was teepees, is tents. Mm -hmm. And what did the Native Americans live in for so many years, in harmony with the land, always giving praise to the great spirit mm -hmm. in the sky? The tribe of Gad controlled the Strait of Gibraltar. And this is what Jeremiah found when he came to reunite the uh, two lines of Judah, is he met with the tribe of Gad there in the Strait of Gibraltar. Consider additional evidence that worshipers of the God of Israel were present in ancient America very early on. Near Albuquerque, New Mexico, ancient Hebrew inscriptions called the Los Lunas inscription record on stone the Exodus version of the Ten Commandments in Paleo-Hebrew. This is amazing. <laughs> this has to be somebody that knows. It has to be after the Exodus, because this is when the Ten Commandments are given. And so 1000 BC fits perfectly with this. Other evidence of ancient worshipers of the God of Israel in America has been noted on what was called the Decalogue Stone, which was found in Ohio. So you've got, from New Mexico to Ohio, artifacts being found that ancient Hebrews were there, and many of them didn't get back on the ships. They said, this is a rich and beautiful land. I think we'll just stay here. There's no marauders, there's no persecution, there's just rich abundance, and they learned to live in harmony with the land. This Decalogue stone is a tablet having an ancient Hebrew inscription of the Ten Commandments unearthed in Ohio in 1860. The tablet, tablet not only has an inscription of the Ten Commandments on it, but it also has a depiction of an individual, which you can see here in the middle, meant to represent Moshe, carved in great detail on the front of the tablet, and a handle at the bottom of the tablet, which may have been used for a strap to adhere to, like a Levite would wear the ephod. This might have been something that Levites even came with tribes of Judah. Many historians think that the Cherokee came from the tribe of Judah. We know that Issachar, some tribes trace their lineage back to Issachar. Some Indian uh, Native American tribes have traced their lineage to Gad. But then you even have this possibility of Levites having come to be able to help facilitate the worship of God in this new world with the other tribes. The tablet was found in a grave with other goods, buried with a body and an earthen mound. A portable tablet with the Ten Commandments in ancient Hebrew found in a grave could very well point to an ancient Levitical priest present with the Israelite explorers in ancient America. Whether or not everyone agrees on the actual date, analysis now confirm after seeing the tablet in ancient Hebrew and many other artifacts found in American soil that the time frame was once again about 1000 BC. So it's all fitting and confirming one another. Then if you look south in how there could be Jewish blood down in Africa, because when we talk about this great awakening, these dry bones are rising, it's happening in Africa as well. People are getting excited about Torah and they don't know why. And so this is my hope is that this little study will help explain that everybody has a heritage in the land of Israel. The Queen of Sheba, we know very famously, came to hear of Solomon's wisdom and he had relations with her, created this peace deal with Sheba, which was Ethiopia, and she had a son named Menelik. And there's even, when I was in Ethiopia, there was um, stories about, in the north, them preserving the Ark of the Covenant, because when Menelik was 18, Sheba, the Queen of Sheba sent him to visit his father in Jerusalem, and it was on his return trip back to Sheba that Solomon had all his other firstborn from his concubines accompany this great son. He was so proud of this son from the Queen of Sheba that he wanted to make sure that he was safe on his journey back. And one of those other sons stole the Ark of the Covenant, it is said in the Ethiopian tradition, and brought it down. And when Menelik found out, he said, what is this great sin that you've done? But then God impressed upon him that no one can touch the Ark of the Covenant without dying unless God intends for it to be taken. And so he realized this must be to protect it. And so they protected it for many years. And so this is why when Nebuchadnezzar came and sacked the temple, and when Titus came and sacked the temple, there's no records of anybody ever capturing the Ark of the Covenant. Only the menorah and the table of showbread and these other artifacts. There's another um, instance of him having relations with a woman called the Princess of Egypt. And Solomon became allied to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, by marriage and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. 1 Kings 3.1 and it also mentions it in 1 Kings 11. Then in the Song of Solomon, it's famously mentioned this unnamed Shunammite woman 
She says in Song of Solomon 1, 5, and 6, I am black but comely. And there's all this beautiful love language that is shared between Solomon and his black bride, his black beloved, who is an analogy of God and his bride. There's a beautiful prophetic analogy in the Song of Solomon if you ever have time to study it. But I just wanted to share these few different quotes to show enough evidence that even down in Africa, there's descendants of Judah intermingled with these people. With the death of Solomon and the threat of civil war between the Israelite tribes of the north and south, the nation broke up into two separate states. And this is what our whole conference has been talking about. This is where you start to think the scattering happens. But look at how much has already been scattered up to this point. Trade allowance alliances with Phoenician city-states continued. And we even know that during the time of Ahab, reigning over the northern ten tribes, he had an alliance with a Phoenician princess named Jezebel. This was intermarriage with the Phoenicians. And so the Phoenicians are taking lots of tribes wherever they go and because of this alliance. So let's look at this deportation of these two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, which we've been talking about with the Mizoram people, um, where they would have traced there. When they talk about being descendants of Manasseh, this is the time frame that their people would have left Israel. So you can see the Overland Silk Route, which we mentioned before, and it goes to China and then drops down to two areas of India. Now, this morning, Margot mentioned that in the Kashmir Valley, there are lost descendants, lost tribes of Israel. This is where the Kashmir Valley would be. It comes right down through here. The Mizoram people would have been on this Silk Road route. And it's amazing that these are famous routes. You don't just go walking in the middle of the wilderness. Everybody takes these routes. It's kind of like taking the interstate when you go someplace. It's faster. It's safer. There was also sea routes that were traveled. And so we could go in for days and days on talking about all the spread of Israel. But this just gives you a little idea. Here is the two and a half tribes that we're talking about. The Jordan River comes down from a spring, feeds the Sea of Galilee called the Canet. Knesseret, and the Jordan River goes south then and empties into the Dead Sea. And this is a big valley here. So you have Reuben, which is to the south, just like I mentioned, he's always to the south of the um, tabernacle, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh that the Mizoram people are from. So when Assyria takes them in 740, they would go to the north and then to start heading on the Silk Road to the east. The uh, exile by Assyria about 18 years later for the rest of the tribes west of the Jordan River. You can see when they were taken north, this is Israel down here, now it's showing a broader perspective. You've got the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, and the Mediterranean. They would have been taken north of the Euphrates, as the scripture says, and then split ways going north and west around the Black Sea. And this is where you get the origin of the Scythians, which the Russians um, are taught that that's their descendants, the ancient Scythians, which were Israelites. And uh, then down here, you would have the Cimmerians. Simmer How do you pronounce it? Cimmerians. They would. Cimmerians. Not to be confused with Samaria. No, no. <laughs> right. Different group, and they're going south. And so this is where Dan would have picked up on the Ishtar River, a pagan river that he renames the Danube. And we have the beautiful song, The Blue Danube. And it takes him up to the north and to Denmark. And then he comes back down and settles with Judah in the British Isles here. But they, you can see all of these different migra migration routes over sea, over land, and populating all of Europe. This is why when people come to America, they just think, oh, well, I'm German. And some of these Germanic tribes, the Romans, changed their name. These were actually a group called Saxons, which came from the Scythians, which get their name from Yitzhak, my namesake, because it was prophesied that some would be known after the name of Yitzhak. And so they've lost their identity. They have no idea who they are by the time they come to America. We have also tin mining that's going on in um, Wales. In the world. In Cornwall, where Stephen Spikerman is from. And we know that Joseph of Arimathea, who was the one that gave his grave to Yeshua, was most likely related to Yeshua and was a tin merchant. 
This means he knew where the lost tribes were, and he's going back and forth to Cornwall. And this is why Yeshua sent his disciples to Cornwall there. Migrations also um, through the Caucasus Mountains. Um, we know that they were wheat suppliers with Athens, Greece. So they were always in contact with each other. The Parthians were a group that came out of Persia and that had migrated east. And they, they were actually a power that Rome could never control or beat. The Parthians were strong. And they always had a ruler over them that was from the tribe of Judah, actually from the lineage of David. They said only the lineage of David is to be a rightful ruler. And so they were very strong, and they actually were like a, almost a mini world power from 227 B.C. to 250 B.C. And then further east, you have some of the tribe of Manasseh migrating into China, Tibet, and down to India. So here's just a few geographic names left by the tribe of Dan. You have Macedonia, Sardinia, Denmark, Danube, Donetsk in Ukraine, Dnipropetrovsk in the Ukraine, Rostov-on-Don in Russia. I have a friend from there. Dnieper, Denester, Danau, Dasi, Davi, Dan, Don, Udon, Eridon, and the thousand other Dons that we won't mention this morning. <laughs> This is how, I don't want to say he's arrogant, but he likes to, you know, name places after himself. <laughs> and his children always want to remember their migration routes, and this is what they would do. So, there's uh, just a little idea of some of the places where some of these tribes settled. It's not a complete list by far. There's a lot of um, historical evidence that suggests that Reuben... Um, actually settled the area of France, which I don't have written on here, but I was talking to Gavin Finley about this morning. But you have Judah uh, inhabiting Israel and Babylon, Persia, India, Russia, Europe, Scotland. You have the tribe of Dan coming up from Greece, settling Russia and Denmark and Ireland and a lot of places in Europe in between that you just mentioned. Naphtali uh, was up in the north of northern Europe, France and Germany. Uh, you see it on the heraldry with the stag. Remember, Naphtali was beautiful like a deer and fast. He was the fastest of the 12 tribes running. And uh, so you see the, a lot of flags in northern Europe uh, with that uh, deer stag on one side. Gad controlled Spain and on to America. We have Issachar and Zebulon up in the Netherlands, which Stephen is from. You were born there, right? Yeah. And you would confirm that? Yes, absolutely. Beautiful. And Manasseh going to China and India, and then the other half of Manasseh going to the west. And this is where Ephraim and Manasseh has come to America as well. Uh, of course, Ephraim was prophesied to be a Medogoyim, a unique prophetic calling, where he would fill up the nations. He has to be a multitude of nations, and only the British Empire can fulfill this prophetic calling, and we will look at that at the very end of this study. And then Benjamin to the northern Europe, his heraldry is a wolf, and uh, we see him migrating up with Judah after the siege on Jerusalem in 70 AD. So let's look at Judah for a little bit and some of the areas that they went to. The 70 years of Judah's exile can be looked at as lasting from 608 to 538, either from the first deportation when Daniel was taken by Nebuchadnezzar to Cyrus, or you can count it from 586 when the temple was destroyed to about 516 when the temple was rebuilt and rededicated in Jerusalem. Either way, it's 70 years that was allotted for their punishment in exile. During this time, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin were taken to Babylon and then to Persia until the time when Ezra returned to Jerusalem with about 50,000 Jews and rebuilt the temple. But many stayed, as I mentioned before, in Babylon and Persia. Many that stayed there immigrated eastward into the mountainous country of Gore, which is central Afghanistan. They were called by the neighboring people Bani Afghani, sons of Afghan, but they've already started to lose their Jewish heritage. And Bani Yisrael, they're remembering their heritage, or the children of Afghan. Now, I would like to talk a little bit about Jeremiah's journey, because after Nebuchadnezzar takes the Jews to um, Babylon, Jeremiah is hiding under the temple with the two last descendants of the line of the king of David, Titepi and Scotia, where we get our name Scotland from. And Jeremiah hid until it was safe to depart down to Egypt. And as I mentioned before, Scotia ended up marrying um, an Egyptian prince who gave her a great palace there in Egypt, so she stayed there. But Jeremiah and Baruch, his scribe, 
set sail with T. Tethy, who ended up commemorating her sister by naming one of the places Scotia, which becomes Scotland, um, after her sister up near Ireland. Jeremiah sails on the ships of the Danites, of the Tuatha de Danan, to Sardinia, and then to Iberia, following that ancient route that Zara had followed years earlier, where he met with the tribe of Gad, who put him in touch with the kings of Judah from Zerah's line, finally bringing Jeremiah and Jacob's pillar, which is the coronation stone. This is the pillar, or the stone that um, Yaakov had his dream on to Ireland. And it has gone through different hands over the last few years, and that's a different study. But um, all of the kings and queens were coronated on that stone. So here again, they're following that same route that Zara's line and Dan's line had followed before to go and to connect Zara's line with Perez's line. Jeremiah the prophet brought Titephi, the tender twig, or the daughter of Zedekiah, from Jerusalem to Ireland, an island once known as the Isle of the Scots. She married Okiad, the high king, from who the line of Judah and Zara and Dan, uh, when I say not Don, the tribe, but Darda, Zerah's son. And their marriage union sealed the breach caused centuries earlier when Judah's twin sons had been born. This marriage union that took place at Roth Nari, the fort of the kings at Tara in royal Meath, is symbolized on the Ulster flag where the red hand of Zerah is mounted upon the Star of David under the single royal crown symbolizing the union of the two royal lions that sprang from Judah. And this is where the Scots symbolism of the red hand originates. So here's a lineage which is really interesting. If you look at the line of Perez, which David comes through, and Solomon, who has a line of kings that end up getting cursed, and no king can sit on the throne anymore from this line of Solomon. So this is why Yeshua's line comes through Nathan, and this is where Mary's line is. But you have Zara's line, who went all the way and settled the Crete uh, area of Greece, and they became the Cretan kings, because the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Wherever they settled, they became the royalty. They were the rulers. Then you have the Trojan kings. They settled Troy, as we mentioned. The Miletian kings are the name of Zara's lion that settled in Spain and then ended up coming up to Ireland, because this had happened over a progression of time. So. The Scot Scottish traced their roots through the Milesian kings that came up from Spain. Then you have the Frankish kings and the Scandinavian kings, and the house of Wetka and the house of Skold, and leading on to the kings of Denmark, the kings of Greece, and King Philip. Now, through the Solomon's lines, you have this other line of Titefi, Zedekiah's daughter, that Jeremiah took up to Ireland, intermarrying with this line of Zara. So this is where they two get intertwined. And they have the kings of Scotland and the kings of Ireland. And this leads all the way down to Queen Elizabeth II. So this is how she traces her lineage and right to rule through both King David, but also through Zara, through Titefi. Here's a picture of them. So you've got Philip's line, and you've got Elizabeth II's line. Elizabeth II is descended from Tepi and Okiad. The word Brit-ish, Brit is covenant in Hebrew. Ish is a man. So you literally have a covenant man or a covenant people, Israel. And the Ulster flag shows Zerah's red hand surrounded by Israel's Star of David, superimposed on the cross of sacrifice. The British coat of arms has David's harp also, which is also a national symbol of Ireland. The lion and the unicorn, and the unicorn actually represents Ephraim, which was a name taken for the whole house of Israel, and it, Stephen alluded to that yesterday, the lion and the unicorn, which are all heraldic signs of Israel. And exactly as Tefi said, in a book she wrote a chronicles of her journey with Jeremiah, and in T. Tefi 2.2 are signs that are to be left to show Israel's true identity. So she left clues so the people would not forget who they are. So anybody that comes from Irish, I saw a couple hands over here this morning that are from Ireland or from Scotland, we have people, or English. I mean, these are all ancient tribal areas. Here's a little map of how it's divided. This northern part of Ireland is controlled by Judah's uh, red hand, Zara's line. The rest of this is Dan's territory. So this is why you get some red-haired Irish and some very black-haired Irish. You've got Scotland up here and England down here. And Wales, where 
Sir Spikerman lives in near Cornwall, um, has these ancient tin, um, tin merchants like Joseph of Arimathea. This is where he would have been coming. Some speculate that when Yeshua was young, those lost years between 12 and 30, that he may have accompanied his uncle uh, Joseph of Arimathea to that area. And this is how he really woke up to understanding about how far spread the 12 tribes are. So now let's skip forward to the first century emissaries. Speaking of Yeshua, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd is willing to lay down his life so that the sheep are taken care of. And it's been this message of him laying down his life that has preserved the sanctity of Israel amongst the nations. Otherwise, we would have totally turned totally Hebrew uh, pagan. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel, Matthew 15, 24. Yeshua sent out the 12 with the following instructions. Don't go among the goyim or into any town of the Samaritans, but rather go only to the places where the lost sheep are. So you're going to go around the world, but you're going to only go where you know our family is. So Yaakov went to Spain. Did you know that? Yaakov is the book of James. It's actually the book of Yaakov. It's just King James wanted his name to be in there, so he changes Yaakov to James. But this is the brother of Yeshua, and he travels to Spain, where they still commemorate his migration route to this day, because there was a big Hebrew population in Spain. Paul went to Greece and Italy and to Spain and to London and to Northern Europe, and you can find that in Acts 29. Timothy went to India, to the lost house there. John wrote to the assemblies in Turkey. This is where the seven assemblies are, around Troy, that Zerah had founded. Peter, an apostle of Yeshua, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. We will look at a map that shows these locations. This is what's recorded in 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 that Margot mentioned earlier. Andrew was commissioned to go to Scythia. So he actually traveled up through that little strait and through the Black Sea and over to where Scythia would have migrated through the north of the Black Sea and the Caucasus and the neighboring countries, primarily allotted to him. First, then, he traveled through Cappadocia, through Turkey to get there, Galatia and Bithynia, and instructed them in the faith of Yeshua, passing all along in the U. Yuzin Sea, that's the old name for the Black Sea. Now, Simon, not to be confused with Peter, but uh, the zealot, directed his journey towards Egypt, to the south. Why would he go there unless there was the House of Israel in Africa? Then to Cyrene, and to uh, the rest of Africa, and throughout Mauritian and Libya, preaching the Basora, the good news, that the lost house has not been forgotten by God. This is what was to encourage the lost house around the world. So once again, when Paul goes, he's following Jeremiah's route and Zerah's route before him. And see, it's not by accident that they're stopping at these same places. Stopping in Argos, stopping in um, Rhode Island, uh, stopping in Crete, then going on to Rome, then from Rome to Sardinia, then from Sardinia to the Ebro River, named for the Hebrews, and then around, and each place people are greeting him and hearing the news, and then all the way up, Paul went to the East Gate of uh, Lud of London, preached there, met the Druids there, then came inland, and he found the place where Pontius Pilate went back to after his commission had ended in Jerusalem, and Pontius Pilate actually committed suicide there. And uh, there's a lot of extra <coughs> writings about that. So these areas that you see in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Bithynia, Galatia, Pontus, this is Turkey here. Here's the Black Sea above and the Mediterranean below. Israel's right here. And then you have, you know, Lebanon today and Syria, but it's so easy to get to, either by land or by sea. This is the very first place that they would have migrated to the north, so this is why John is writing to them. This is where the seven assemblies are. Lydia, Pergamum is right in here. There's a lot of paganism mixed with uh, these lost tribers. All of the people living in Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia were Israelites, according to Josephus as well. Josephus, the Jewish historian, was familiar with Parthia as a major dwelling place of the ten tribes, and he states, but then the entire body of the people of Israel remained in that country. Wherefore, they are but two tribes in Asia and Europe, subject to the Romans, while the ten tribes are beyond the Euphrates till now and are an immense multitude. They'd already been multiplying by the first century, and Josephus recognized this. 
and they're not even to be estimated by numbers. So then if you skip 40 years ahead, after the crucifixion of Yeshua and the emissaries sent out to the lost tribes, you also have Judah being sent out by the Roman siege. And after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, more Jews lived in the diaspora than actually lived in Israel, migrating to all these areas that they knew the ten tribes already were residing in. Why go to someplace else when you've got brothers in a foreign land? So this is why so many Jews spread throughout Europe, because the Lost House was already there, including the Russian Jews and Europe. During the Middle Ages, due to increasing migration and resettlement, Jews divided into distinct regional groups, which today are generally addressed according to two primary geographical groupings. In Europe, we know the Jews as either the Ashkenazi Jews, where I trace my lineage through, or the Sephardic Jews of Spain and Portugal and North Africa and the Middle East. So here is about now, we're skipping forward through the, the first thousand years from 70 AD, the Jewish migration to their brothers in Europe. All the different places that they were moving to are places where the lost house already resided. So here's the Black Sea again. This is where Andrew would have ministered. And you've got uh, all of Europe here. We know that the largest groupings of Jews are these yellow areas like Lithuania, Germany, Poland, Hungary, Austria, the Crimea, and throughout Russia. And each one of these yellow cities are places where there was big Jewish settlements that settled with their Jewish brothers from the Lost House of Israel. There's a man named Nathan Osubel who actually made a list of different places where he had researched and found either Jews or Lost Tribers uh, throughout the world. And in 1953, he does this book called The Pictorial History of the Jewish People and compiles the following list, connected in one way or another to these Jewish Israelite Hebrew traditions. He found them in Baghdad, Iran, Kurdistan, Yemen, Georgia, Bokhara, Had Haramat, mountain Jews, Afghanistan, B'nai Israel, the Kokin Jews, China, Egypt, Algeria, Morocco, Libya, Tunisia, Jerba, the Sahara, the cave dwellers of the Atlas Mountains near Tripolamia, and the Falsadas near Lake Tana in Ethiopia, and the Samaritans, which claim to be from the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh and Levi. And of course, we visit them when we are in Israel. If you take a trip with Mark and I to Israel, we can introduce you to the high priest of the Samaritans, who is there to this day and traces his lineage back 163 generations to Adam and through the tribes of Israel. And he opened up his synagogue to me and showed me his ancient books written in Paleo-Hebrew and Torah scrolls that are over 2,000 years old. And he showed me his genealogy, which was so beautiful to see from the high priest of the Samaritans. So now we fast forward to 1492 and the Alhambra Decree and the dispersion, the further dispersion. All the Jews and Hebrews that are settled in Spain now are going to get sent even more to the Americas. And now it's not just North America, it's South and Central America. You can see that right at the same time that Queen Isabella <laughs> decreed that all the Jews had to leave. And when I say Jews, anybody who looks like an Israelite, so anybody who's observing Torah, they get called Jews. To this day, Jews talk about the whole house of Israel as Jews, but it's really not exactly accurate. But So all these Israelites whoops, are kicked out of Spain just about the same time that God opens up the doors for Columbus to be funded to go to this new world. So they all jump on the ship. The majority of them were Jews leaving town. Those that couldn't get on the ships came over and settled in Morocco. We know that from the 1100s, there's been different persecution, either by the Roman Catholic Church or by the Ottoman Empire, Islam, to force conversion upon the Hebrew people. And even Rambam, uh, he was born in Spain. He ended up migrating through Morocco and then on to Egypt. And he was a great physician and a great expositor of uh, Torah. And uh, he went back to Israel, but through this route from Spain, down through Morocco, over to Egypt, and back to Israel. So that's Rambam's story. But here is how so many of the people, I've ministered in Costa Rica and Central America quite a bit, they have no idea of their identity. Today, there's millions of Shepardim in Latin America. This is the good news for them as well. There's a reason why they felt a hunger for God, but 
Roman Catholicism has been pushed upon them, so it's all they've known. It's what they're born with. They're raised. My mom and dad were that way. Their parents were that way, so we're all Roman Catholics. They've forgotten their identity. This includes people throughout Mexico, Central, and South America. They don't realize that they are the children of Israel and of David. Different Sephardic names that go back to Israel, I'm not even going to list them all, <laughs> but you can see them there. If you're Spanish and you got one of these names, you're Jewish, or you're of the tribes of Israel. Then there was other routes after Columbus that kept bringing people to the New World. Basically, America has been opened up to be a safe haven over the last 250 years for God's children so that they wouldn't be persecuted. Once the persecution happens, God opens up another place for them to be safe. America is actually in prophecy, and I can show you if you ask me later. So, the ninth migration, just to touch on it, I don't want to go into depth, but Israel is also in the Philippines. When Mark and I was in Israel this last uh, November, we saw a huge number of Filipinos awakening. The dry bones are arising in the Philippines, and they're coming by the droves back to Israel, and they want to learn Torah, and they've actually invited Mark to come and teach in the Philippines. During the Age of Discovery in the 15th and 16th century, Portugal and Spain pioneered European exploration of the globe and in the process established large overseas empires. The first recorded visit by the Europeans is the arrival of Magellan from Spain. And the Philippines, so this is just a little while after the Alhambra decree and most of the Jews leave Spain and go to the New World, but there's still some Jews that are in Spain. And when the Philippines open up and these Spanish colonies start, some of the Jews follow Magellan to the Spanish colonies in the Philippines. And here is a picture of a beautiful Passover Seder, a Pesach Seder in 1925 in the Philippines. Isn't that beautiful? They're keeping the holy days. The Spanish Inquisition in the 16th century forced many Jews in Spain to convert to Christianity or to flee. And these Jewish new Christians were known as Moranos. That means that uh, the Israelite has basically been forced to convert, also known as conversos in Spanish. Some called crypto-Jews because really we convert just to not get killed and not to have our family killed because life trumps all in the Torah, but we are still keeping and preserving the traditions of Yah alive in our families. We're called crypto-Jews because crypto means pseudo. You know, it's kind of like you're a fake Jew. Okay, you converted to Christianity, but you're still observing Judaism, and the Catholic Church hated that. And they actually killed lots of people, even from the Philippines, who were these crypto-Jews keeping the traditions of Yah alive from the Torah. They observed their Jewish rites in secret. The Inquisition investigated and persecuted many of the conversos, accusing them of practicing in secret, some without substantial basis. Thus, many of the original Sephardi Jews and Moranos came from the Iberian Peninsula of Spain and fled to the new Spanish colony in the Philippines. And in the mountainous area of uh, northwest China, west of the Min River, near the border of Tibet, in Sichuan lives the ancient people called by the Chinese Qiang, or Qiang Min, who numbers about 250,000 people. This tribe has been living a special Israeli way of life since ancient times that they migrated, which goes back to 740 BC when they were uh, taken by Assyria and migrated on the Silk Road. According to their tradition, the Chiang tribe is the descendant of Abraham, and their forefather had 12 sons. Those among them who did not make the Chinese, who did not take Chinese wives for themselves after their victory in war, still look Semitic to this day. You can see by the difference in the nose. The nose knows. It always gives it away. <laughs> they believe in one God, whom they call Abaki, meaning the Father of Heaven or Mabiku, the spirit of heaven, much like the Native Americans, just in different areas of the world. So now, the final dispersion of Israel around the world came through the British Empire through the help of Ephraim. Following the union between England and Scotland in 1707, Great Britain became the dominant colonial power in North America. It then became the dominant power in the Indian subcontinent after the East India Company's conquest of Mughal Bengals at the Battle of Plassey in 1757. British attention soon turned towards Asia, Africa, and the Pacific Islands. And every place that they're colonizing, they're sending people from the Lost House of Israel who's already in Europe to man their stations. So Israel's getting spread out by the British Empire to control all of these places. Britain emerged as the principal naval and imperial power of the 19th century. 
Unchallenged at sea, British dominance was later described as Pax Britannica, meaning British peace, a period of relative peace in Europe and the world through 1815 to 1914, during which the British Empire became the global, global hegemony and adopted the role of global policemen. In the early 19th century, the Industrial Revolution began to transform Britain so that by the time of the Great Exhibition in 1851, the country was described as the workshop of the world. The British Empire expanded to include most of India, large parts of Africa, and many other territories throughout the world, alongside the formal control that Britain exerted over its own colonies its dominance of much of the world trade meant that it effectively controlled the economies of many regions, such as Asia and Latin America as well. So places where the ten tribes from Europe now get scattered are the British Isles, the Ireland, US, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Australia, Falkland. There's a huge awakening happening in South Africa today by the millions. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Burma, Afghanistan, all of the conquered territories of the British Empire that are listed there. And, and then there's extraterritorial possessions such as Hong Kong, which they had up until 1999. It was like a 99-year lease. And then places in Singapore, and Gibraltar, and a whole list of Caribbean islands that we won't list today. But it just shows you how Israel would have continued to be scattered. Genesis 48, 19 says, And his father refused and said, I know my son, I know. He also shall become a people, referring to Manasseh. And he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother Ephraim, he's going to be greater. And he will become a multitude of nations. He's going to fill up the nations. And it was Ephraim's name that Israel took to represent themselves. After comparing the Hebrew Melo Hakoin construction with other nouns in the passage, we find that the clear translation is his seed will fill up the nations. And this is the same word that's used in Exodus 16.32 when we talk about filling up an omer of wheat on Shavuot. It's actually melo ha-omer in Hebrew. So here is the expansion, the further expansion, in addition to all the other places that we've mentioned. Everything in pink, it was controlled by the British Empire. Until, amazingly, the time when Israel is created as a nation, all of a sudden the British freely start giving away these territories, giving the rights back to the people. They're letting go of them so that the whole house of Israel can come home. It's around 1947 that Kenya was let go of by the Britain, British Empire. It was 1947 that Pakistan and India were let go by the British Empire. It was 1940s. I'll show you a little list of the times that they let go of their different empires. This is all the places that they were scattered in the years that they released them freely. Now, most world power never freely says, okay, I'm just going to let go of all of my conquest. This is a miracle. Everybody's available to come back home today by divine intervention and prophetic foresight. So the question isn't, where are the lost tribes of Israel? The real question is, where aren't they? We are everywhere. So I hope this blesses you in greater understanding and you can share this with your friends. I want you to have a good lunch, be blessed, and we will see you right after lunch. Thank you.